the idea for the exhibition came about just like in most rare um, book and special collections. It came about because um, we have a strength in anti-slavery materials, a tremendous strength in that um, in that area, and that is because of a friendship between Andrew Dixon White, the first president of Cornell, and Samuel Joseph May. They were very good friends, so therefore, early on in Cornell's history in 1870, a year before Samuel Joseph May died, he donated his entire library to Cornell University. And that library consisted of approximately 10,000 anti-slavery pamphlets. And after that, Andrew Dixon White himself supplemented the collection with Civil War um, pamphlets that he had. After that, word got out to other abolitionists that, oh, Cornell's collecting this, these types of materials. So they started to send their papers, and it just kept building and building. Actually, our most uh, recent addition to our anti-slavery collection is the Gail and Stephen Rudin slavery collection. And that documents slavery in everyday life and how it, um, it kind of was part of the fabric of American culture. And those, some of those items appear in the exhibition as well. Part of the items of the Gail and Stephen Rudin slavery collection are two letters, and two letters that we have featured in the the exhibition, and they're written by two slave women. And those letters, the first one is dated 1848, and it's written by Annie, the slave. We don't know her last name, but she writes to her former slave master. And it's pretty bold in that she asserts herself like that. And in those letters, she's writing to him, and she tells him that she has a child now, and she wants to be reunited with the children that she's left behind on his um, plantation. and. She's telling him that, you know, if you can't come send for me, then just give me word about how my children at the plantation that she's left behind are doing, and um, tell me if they've had children. And one statement that's really kind of profound in the whole letter, it's all my dream to be re reunited with my children. But what's very sad about this letter is that we know that this re um, reunion never occurred because unbeknownst to her, he's her a master, a former master, has died two years previous to her writing that. So you know that he's ne he will never get the letter and her wish will never be granted. The other letter is written by another slave woman and it deals with um, longings and separation from family. And she's an adult slave woman who's just recently had a baby boy and um, I think he's three months old and she's writing to her mother who's been sold away to another plantation and she's telling her mother about her new baby and he's such a fine baby and her children, um, her, pre her other children really miss um, her gra their grandmother and um, they long for her. Um, what's, notable, what's really um, noteworthy about this letter is that in the letter um, she expresses how her master tried to get her mother's master to sell her back but he wouldn't consent to it. So it's really interesting in that way. Um, but th those two letters deal with just what it's, the, heart, the heartbreak of being separated for, from your loved ones and not really being able to have control over your own life or your own relationships in that way. Yeah. Make me a grave wherever you will in a lowly plain or a lofty hill. Make it among earth's ominous graves, but not in a land where men are slaves. Um, some of the tactics that um, abolitionists employed in order to forward the movement were, I'll start with the most benign, um, I, they would publish texts or books and they'd get celebrities of the day, you know, to write um, anti-slavery tracts or poems or some kind of writing to promote the movement. And then they'd sell those at anti-slavery bazaars. And so it would serve two purposes. Um, the one purpose would be it gets the word out 
the anti-slavery word out to the general public, and it also raised money for the for the cause because we know that all causes need to have money in order to function. Um, we also have anti-slavery tokens, and those were used to promote the, the movement. On one side of the token um, is a saying like liberty. On the other side is a, the motto, I am a man, and it's um, accompanied with a, with a little engraving of sort of a man, a slave kneeling, a chained slave kneeling, and that image was created by Josiah Wedgwood. So that's in the exhibition too, and that was used to kind of popularize the cause. Also, hymns and songs were used, and what people would do is take the popular tunes of the day and then create anti-slavery words to go, to go with those um, tunes in order to kind of get the, cause, um, get the cause out there in the public. And also, they use things to address all the different types of audiences, and one of those audiences um, were children. And um, children's books were used, anti-slavery children's books, and what, they, what abolitionists would do would create, um, there were true stories of slave children, and they tell their story and how they were separa separated from their family members, and they'd use those stories in order to um, indoctrinate um, white children to be sympathetic and empathetic to, to these slave children. Also, we, had, um, we have in our exhibition a anti-slavery primer, an, an alphabet book for using abolitionist, slavery, anti-slavery um, uh, terms in order to teach children about the alphabet and as well as to teach them that um, slavery is wrong. <laughs> Slave narratives were very, very powerful first-hand accounts that um, really helped to bring the message home to people in their, their own homes. have a puzzle that's really a, a quite an interesting um, addition to our exhibition and the theme of the puzzle is emancipation and it has lots of different scenes um, from slavery as well as or an idealized scene of um, liberation from slavery and at the top of that puzzle is a, um, is a picture of a, a goddess type like a winged a Nike type and she's um, above the slaves, and it's like the, an idealized version of, um, of what emancipation or liberation or freedom would, would look like. That was in the, um, the late um, 18th century initially um, with the Quakers. The Quakers were the first to really initiate the movement, and it was revolutionary for them to do that. But then um, that died down, and then later on in the 19th century, um, the mid, well, the first third of the 19th century, that's when um, the abolitionist movement that people kind of know about, that's when it comes, it comes about then. In the, um, yeah. But, I mean, people were doing little things along the way, but the 1830s, that's when um, you really start, um, right. In the 1850s, it became really hot because of the uh, fugitive slave law, and people were fighting against that. Many Northerners were mostly anti-abolitionists and anti-black. Um, this was because they were gaining a lot from fr the free labor South because the, the North, even though it was, um, it was industrialized and not agriculturally based, they used many, many of the textiles, the raw products that came from the South, so there was a strong adherence to it. And not just what you know, people um, think lower class people or thugs, but really the merchant class across the board, um, from the poorest to the wealthiest, overall, generally speaking, they were against um, emancipation or freeing the slaves because the North was gaining a lot from, the, from having slavery. And also with an adherence to um, 
keeping the racial caste system or the social order. They felt threatened by um, potentially freeing blacks. They thought, what are they going to do? Are they all going to come up here and take our jobs? So it was, they felt threatened by the, by the thought of slaves being free. And because of that, abolitionists were often met with violence in the North because they were, um, because of the, these, this mob presence that always seemed to be there um, during their speeches and, and gatherings. And that was another way that they would try to get their message out by doing many, many gatherings or public uh, meetings, public speeches. And um, that was often used, but it was oftentimes met with uh, mob violence. <laughs> The Emancipation Proclamation is a presidential decree that freed slaves in the rebelling states. So all the southern states that, states that were rebelling against the North or that seceded from the Union, those slaves were freed. However, those border states that were loyal to the Union, and those states were Missouri, Maryland, Delaware, and Kentucky, those slaves weren't freed. Cotton rows crisscross the world, and dead, tired nights of yearning, thunderbolts on leather straps, and all my body burning, sugar cane reach up to God, and every baby crying, shame the blanket of my night, and all my days are dying. Republican Access are abolitionists, are anti-slavery collection in a variety of ways. First, they can come to the archives and actually view them in person. If they have a photo ID, then they can um, go to our reading room and look at some of these documents. They can find some of the documents, too, on an online searchable database. Um, the Samuel J. May Anti-Slavery Pamphlet Collections are on an online searchable database. And actually, you can look at that in your own home. If you do keyword search, if you want to look for particular things in a document, those documents, after you search, those documents actually come up. Actually, actual pictures of those documents, and you can print them off just as you were looking at them in an actual um, setting. Um, also, of course, you can look at them in our reading room, and you can actually access the exhibition online, too, and it will be up indefinitely, even after the physical exhibition leaves. 